The circular function is also repetitive in nature. As the terminal arm of an angle and standard position rotates about the origin, it encounters the same points on the circumference for every revolution that it makes. I can demonstrate this idea using the hands of this clock. If I allow the hour hand to rotate in a counterclockwise or a positive direction, you can see that the hand of the clock encounters the same numbers on the clock circumference every revolution. Now I can use this circle here, this bendable wire, to represent a circle with a radius of one unit. If I place it on a set of coordinate axes so that the center of my circle is at the origin of my axes, I can begin to label some of the points and arc lengths on its circumference. You'll recall that the arc length is equal to the radius multiplied by the central angle, angle theta, where theta is given to us in radians. Since the value of the radius for this circle is 1, the arc lengths have the same numerical value of the angles and radians that they subtend. Therefore, a central angle of 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians, cuts off an arc length of pi over 2 units. Similarly, if theta is represented by pi radians, the arc length is pi units. Continuing around in a counterclockwise direction, if theta is 3 pi over 2 radians, then our arc length is 3 pi over 2 units, and all the way to one complete revolution of 2 pi radians, or 2 pi units. Now the interesting thing about this circle is I can unravel it to create a straight line. When I do that, you can see that I keep my same beginning point of the circle at the origin of my coordinate plane. And what happens is I get a new horizontal axis where the first measurement is pi over 2 radians, the second one is pi radians, the third one is 3 pi over 2 radians, and the last one on here is 2 pi radians. So you see this is how the circumference of a circle can be used as a horizontal axis of a new coordinate plane whenever we graph trigonometric functions. In order to understand the nature of graphs of the sine and cosine functions, we'll begin by examining a circle placed on the coordinate plane. The center of this circle is at the origin of the coordinate plane. The radius of this circle, r, will have a length of one unit. You may recall that in any right triangle containing an angle theta, the sides of the triangle can be labeled as opposite or adjacent relative to angle theta. The longest side, the side opposite the right angle, is called the hypotenuse. We can take such a triangle and place the vertex angle theta in standard position at the origin. Notice that the hypotenuse of the triangle has a length of one unit because it is equal in length to the radius of the circle. Because A is the length of the horizontal side of the triangle, we can rename it X. Similarly, O, the length of the vertical side, is renamed Y. Thus, we can name the intersection of the terminal arm of angle theta with the circle point P, whose coordinates are X, Y. Now, if you look at the sine and cosine of angle theta, we can see that the sine of the angle is the ratio Y over 1, or simply Y. The cosine ratio is X over 1, or X. The key to graphing our trigonometric functions lies in the circle of radius 1. This circle can be labeled in a number of ways. Looking specifically at the special angles in standard position, which are multiples of 30 degrees, or pi over 6 radians, the terminal arm can be labeled with the angle's measure in degrees, or in radians. An angle measured in radians is the ratio of arc length to radius. Labeling the angles in radians also gives us corresponding arc length measurements due to our use of a radius of one unit. We could also label the terminal arm of each of these special angles with coordinates P, X, Y. These coordinates are the lengths of the sides of the right triangle with a base angle theta, whose vertex is at the origin. You've seen these values before in their respective special triangles. As we proceed, you must remember that in a circle of radius 1, the y-coordinate of the point is the sine of angle theta, and the x-coordinate is the cosine of angle theta. To graph the function of f of theta equals sine theta, we can take the circle and unravel it to use as our horizontal axis. 
Notice then that the x-axis is now labeled with angle measures. Because of this, we will not call it the x-axis, but the theta axis. The y-coordinates of the points we plot will be the sine value of each angle between 0 and 2 pi radians. The sine of 0 radians is 0. The sine of pi over 6 radians is 0 0.5. The sine of pi over 3 radians is approximately 0 0.866. The sine of pi over 2 radians is 1. We can continue plotting the points corresponding to quadrants 2, 3, and 4. If we join the points with a smooth curve, we can see the graph of f of theta equals sine theta. If the terminal arm continues to rotate past 2 pi, we see that the same points are encountered on the circumference of the circle. Therefore, the same pattern emerges for the sine function with every complete rotation of the terminal arm, or every 2 pi radians. If the terminal arm rotates in a negative or clockwise direction, from 0 to negative 2 pi radians, we see the same pattern appear between negative 2 pi and 0. Using a similar process, we can graph the function f of theta equals cosine theta. Remember the cosine of these angles was given as cosine theta equals the x-coordinate of the point P. Again, using the angle measures along the horizontal axis, and now taking the corresponding x-coordinates from the points P, x, y, around our circle of radius 1, we can plot the points theta, cosine theta. If we join these points with a smooth curve, we see the graph of the cosine function of g of theta equals cosine theta. As with the sine function, the cosine function has one pattern repeat infinitely right and left every 2 pi radians. Yeah.